Uh, yeah, as, as stated, uh, my name is Brandon. Uh, I work on the uh, Centrifuge uh, project. Uh, I'm a substrate engineer uh, with a Rust background, um, mostly, uh, but not entirely, read-only on uh, Solidity. Uh, for the past year and a half, I have been uh, primarily working on uh, converting our main uh, product slash project uh, from Ethereum uh, to be part of our uh, substrate chain uh, as a bunch of pallets. Uh, and that's several thousand lines of solidity into many, many more lines of rust, um, although that's not one-to-one -one because we have added new features in the process of this uh, port. Um, Feel free to jump in with questions. Um, if I just blow through my sides, this is gonna be a very quick talk. Um, I think we have a normal time slot, but there's no one right after me, so if there are conversations to be had, I'm happy to have them. Um, and I'm happy to pull up real life code examples, dig deeper into anything, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the, the sort of high level agenda, um, why did we decide to move from Ethereum to Substrate in the first place, um, some high-level language thoughts on Rust versus Solidity, um, and then getting into some of the nitty-gritty things that are really different between the two, um, especially around error handling, uh, math, storage, uh, and weights slash gas and benchmarking in uh, Substrate, everybody's favorite thing. Um, so why did we pick Substrate? Um, mostly all of the same reasons that, you know, Parity and Web3 Foundation say that we should be using Substrate. Uh, the frictionless upgrades, uh, being our own level one chain, um, but really especially computational flexibility, right? Things like being able to have unsigned extrinsics, uh, being able to have uh, the chain automatically perform operations and things like on initialize, on finalize, on idle. Um, really having control over when and how computation happens in the chain. Um, and of course, Rust is a huge uh, benefit. Um, so Rust um, versus Solidity. Um, Rust's big draw for me is the strong type system. Um, this has let us really rewrite a bunch of Solidity code that was kind of a ball of mud of functions into much more structured um, code using Rust types and Rust's abstractions. Um, this has definitely caught bugs in our re-implementation, just having Rust's type system available to us. Um, but it does add complexity, um, and it does, uh, of course, increase compile times. Rust and Substrate are slow. Um, the other great thing with Rust, of course, is its backwards compatibility story. Um, <laughs> Solidity 0.8 uh, docs have this great section called Silent Changes of Semantics, which frankly terrifies me for writing financial software. <laughs> um, yeah, so moving into more specific things, um, substrate error handling is, of course, Rust's error handling, which is very explicit. Um, in Solidity, generally failures are basically exceptions, uh, they abort execution flow. Uh, in Rust, you're going to have some kind of error object that you're going to have to handle, bubble up to the user. Uh, Substrate does some nice things to make this a little bit easier than normal Rust. Um, with the dispatch error type, uh, that gives you automatic conversion between error types across palettes, as well as some standard errors for uh, common situations. Uh, and of course, Rust gives you the question mark operator and combinators, but it's still a lot more verbose than the uh, matching Solidity code, or yeah, Solidity code would be. Um, the other big difference is related to how storage changes are handled when a failure happens. Um, in Solidity, calls are transactional by default, which means in case of some sort of error or failure, all of your changes are undone. This is not the case in Substrate. Uh, in Substrate, you have to explicitly pick some method of handling cleanup. Um, and that's usually gonna be either making an extrinsic transactional or using something like trimutate, so you just skip actually committing your changes to storage. Um, and I've got 
quick example of kind of both of those operations um, and when you might use them. Uh, in the first one, uh, we do a balance transfer, and then if the second balance transfer fails, we need to roll back the first one. Rather than trying to write that logic ourselves, we just use transactional up here, um, and that tells Substrate to just automatically undo in case of an error. Um, in the bottom one, we only have sort of one error case, so we can write our code, write to our value as if we're going to change it, uh, and then if this errors, the whole try mutate aborts and it's never actually committed to storage in the first place. Um, in my experience, once you get past the most simple extrinsics, you're gonna end up making everything transactional. Uh, keeping track of when it is and isn't safe to rely on try mutates or nested try mutates becomes impossible um, and it is almost always better to just slap transactional on, on anything complex. Um, the other thing that was really nice moving from uh, Solidity to Substrate was having a robust math library. Uh, anyone who has done really complex math in Solidity has almost certainly had to write some of their own math functions that really should be built in. Uh, I know that uh, Tin Lake had several of its own. Um, so Solidity gives us uh, standard fixed point traits and types, uh, specific types for representing fractions, um, all that interact nicely with integers, which is what your balance is almost certainly going to be. It's a big integer of Satoshi's, um, and all with good support for checked math, um, which, uh, I believe Solidity 0.8 added checked math by default, finally, um, although as with uh, all other errors in Solidity, it's a, it's a revert and there's sort of no way to you know, manually handle and recover from that error if you want to. Um, checked arithmetic on uh, Substrate is uh, nice. Uh, but it is, again, because it's explicit error handling in Rust, uh, it can be tedious and verbose. Uh, what I have found is you almost certainly always want to break out any complex math into its own function because then you can use the question mark operator and it's just a lot cleaner. Um, or the other option is to just go full functional. Uh, and this is kind of two different implementations of a, of a checked accumulate. Uh, which can either functionally fold everything and if any error fails, it will finally return none and turn that into an error. Or in this version, uh, we have this inner helper function uh, which exits with none if uh, any of the checked additions fail. Uh, this one is actually better, not just because it's more readable, but also because it uh, exits early. Whereas this one will happily iterate over the rest of them deciding that it can't add over and over. Um, which I didn't realize until this morning when I re-looked at my examples. Uh, storage is the other big difference. Uh, um, storage in Ethereum is slots. Every slot, which is uh, 256 bits of data, is going to be uh, its own read or write operation, sort of no matter how you structure that data in your code. If you have a big array, uh, that's going to be potentially in a bunch of slots. If you have a hash map, that's going to be in a bunch of slots. Um, it doesn't really matter. Um, whereas in Substrate, uh, your access to storage is based off of the specific storage item and the generated storage key, which means that uh, you can more easily store larger data, let's, don't, don't go wild and be storing megabytes, but you know, arrays of hundreds or thousands of items are reasonable to store as a single storage item, and that's only a single storage lookup in Substrate, which can allow you to uh, much more easily, say, if you have uh, a function that needs to generally iterate over a bunch of items, storing it as a, as a vector actually makes sense in Substrate and, and can give you performance and uh, weight improvements that you wouldn't necessarily see in uh, EVM. Um, and, and 
definitely one of the things uh, in Substrate is that those storage read writes are expensive, um, especially if you're a parachain. Uh, I think I did the math and you only get like 5,000 storage writes if you're in a parachain right now, which is not a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, moving forward as, as parachains get bigger blocks, that will be less of a restriction. Um, but of course, moving forward, we're also going to see uh, the proof of validity weight being taken into account, which means the number of bytes that have to be sent to the relay chain uh, will start to count towards transaction weight, and that will probably change some of this calculus about how you choose to store large values in the future. Um, but for, for now, we've had really good luck um, improving performance by compressing things into a smaller number of storage items and iterating over them from within uh, within the Rust code, within the substrate code, and the, uh, the saved weight on storage accesses is huge <laughs> compared to the computational cost of, of extra iteration in, uh, in the Rust code. Um, and speaking of, of weight, uh, gas and weight are different. Uh, so gas in Ethereum is computed live while your code is running. Um, it's typically estimated off-chain by your, uh, your client. And then uh, the exact gas based off of the exact set of opcodes that your code executed will be the final price that you pay uh, for your transaction. In Substrate, uh, weight is uh, generally estimated on chain. You're going to have some sort of benchmarking function that you've done, uh, and that will uh, give, you the, give your chain the information that it, it needs to be able to sort of know how heavy a given extrinsic is. Um, and that benchmarking is uh, pain. <laughs> Benchmarking has been the biggest pain point, I think, of the migration from Solidity to Substrate for us. Um, good benchmarks are, need to be part of your threat modeling because if your benchmarks do not take into account the full computational cost of your uh, transactions, uh, then you will have overweight blocks and they can break your chain. Um, they, so they need to capture the real computational complexity and especially the worst case scenarios of that computational complexity. Um, one of the ways to help make that easier is when you have complex code paths to break up the benchmarks into different chunks um, and, and benchmark them separately so that you can sort of aggregate the benchmarking information. Um, but even better than that is to try not to uh, write code that requires super complex benchmarks. Uh, I will say that I have largely failed at that, and a lot of our code requires super complex benchmarks. Um, all right, so a, a simple example here of, of sort of benchmarking two code paths is we have this same uh, extrinsic that we're calling uh, with different sets of parameters. Um, here, we just pass in this vector uh, of foos as a parameter. And in this case, we also have bars that are in storage, uh, and we say to also use them as part of this extrinsic. Um, this is basically the simplified version of, of what all of our benchmarks look like. Um, and in use, what you end up with here is you can see that for the version that just uses the parameter, um, the weight information can actually be computed based off of that parameter. Uh, so you don't have to necessarily uh, charge the user extra and then send the money back. Uh, whereas the version that uh, relies on storage, you need to have some kind of max bound on that. Um, and that max bound should be the same that bounds your, uh, your array in storage. Um, it'll be a parameter on your uh, palette configuration uh, for a bounded vec or something like that. Um, and then depending on the code path that we use, um, we specify sort of which of these two weights is the final weight of the function. Um, you can also do much more complex things with weights um, if it's easier to benchmark sort of subsets of functionality and then add them up um, in the middle. 
Um, I can pull up some, I think, real-world code examples of that if anyone's interested. Um, all right, that went fast. <laughs> I'm sorry, I talked fast. Uh, but those were, those were the big things. Um, you know, I think the other thing that doesn't have a slide is, um, you know, going all the way back to the beginning. Um, you know, the, the type system and being able to break things down and create clean interfaces around subsets of functionality um, has been, you know, the biggest boon. Um, I think definitely uh, has outweighed things like benchmarking as far as, uh, you know, correctness for us. Um, and certainly makes things like auditing much more straightforward. Um, but yeah, um, again, I'm happy to dive into anything in more detail, pull up real uh, code examples, but um, questions, comments, thoughts? <laughs> Hello. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Um, can you, like, do, do you know, like, why the weights have to be estimated on chain as opposed to just using the Ethereum approach where you give a node, like, a transaction you want to execute, it kind of simulates it against the current head? Um, so, my understanding is that that is related to uh, using Wasm and especially allowing the uh, Wasm environment to do things like JIT. It, you're, we're not running in an interpreter where we can keep count of every sort of virtual instruction. It's like compiled, optimized by the JIT environment. Um, and it gives us a huge performance increase in Substrate to be able to um, just sort of say, okay, we know this whole operation takes so many microseconds instead of counting sort of every instruction. Okay. Um... And so with, with your code example, I think you showed, uh, like, you choose the weight to be the maximum. Yeah. Is that maximum weight uh, analogous to, uh, like, a gas limit? So that's the maximum weight you're allowed, but if it uses less than that, then the actual weight will be less? Right. So what, what happens uh, in Substrate is that it uh, ensures, basically, that the user can pay whatever this maximum weight is, and it is sort of analogous to the gas limit, except the chain decides it, not the user. Um, and then based off of whatever you sort of return as your final weight, based off of the actual computations you've done, uh, it refunds the difference between uh, sort of the initial estimation and the final version. Um, so, you know, in this case, because, uh, you know, weight, weight computation has to be fast, uh, so we can't, like, query storage to know how many bars there are, right? So we say, okay, you have to be able to pay for whatever, a thousand of them, because that's our max, but then if we only have four, you know, you'll, you, at the end, you'll only pay for four. Got it. Okay, thank you. Is um, not so familiar with Substrate, so this might be quite newbie questions. Um, on the weights and the storage, one thing is you mentioned you get about five thousand storage. Is that what per block? That's yeah. I think it's well. It's either five. I think it's like five thousand storage rights per block if you're using uh, parities. Uh, weights for how much, for how heavy a storage operation is. Um, it's like a hundred microseconds and a block has to be half a second. So I might have missed an order of magnitude in there. Maybe it's five right. million. Uh, so, so, but, so it's but it's still, it's, it's fairly restricted and it adds up pretty it's quickly. It's configurable, but it's configurable, but it's still limited by the relay right. chain because you'd have to take um, and it's. It's much more limited on parachains right now because parachains have to have a very short computation time due to how they're rolled up into Polkadot. Um, Parity is doing stuff to, to improve that so that Parity's parachains can have a longer computation time. Um, but that, that limitation hurts, hurts parachains a lot more than a standalone uh, substrate chain. It's just due to the, the limited block time. And the other thing about storage was I didn't... You mentioned like uh, bundling things into write. So obviously in Ethereum you pay per 32 bytes. So how does it work that it's cheaper to bundle things into long elements? Yeah, um, basically you bundle things into whatever structures make sense. Um, generally, 
um, there's no uh, the, the 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 weight is per storage operation, um, and that you know should hopefully never be more than I don't know a couple of kilobytes, or you're going to start doing bad things to your database. Um, so is it that you don't really pay? Larger storage is not really so much more expensive. It's not proportional, is it? Right. So so when you're writing your own uh, your own pallets for for you know a chain that you're you're contributing to, generally larger storage isn't as big of a deal as the number of storage keys because the depth of the storage tree is what's going to you know make traversal slower and things like that. Thank you. Um, so actually I have a, a couple of questions. So I think one of your earlier slides, you, meant, or you mentioned something like the more complex extrinsics, you tend to wrap them in the transactional um, yeah. thing. Do you, any kind of thoughts in terms of like performance impact of um, that approach versus more of a manual approach of? It has sure a performance you... impact. Uh, I don't know how easy it is to benchmark and I haven't tried. Um, I think generally trying to, for, for any really complex, like if you're building high level business logic that's doing you know multiple balance transfers and potentially working with NFTs and things like that, like trying to keep track of what you might need to revert is so, so hard um, that just letting the database layer do it is, is better. Um, I, I haven't even, considered trying to do it manually, uh, honestly. Okay. Uh, and then the other question, so on the benchmarking side, so obviously once you've written your benchmarks, like on one of your slides you have those, those example um, benchmarks, you obviously then have to run them on some sort of machine somewhere. What, what, what sort of, it, like, do you have like some reference machine that you run your benchmarks on and then yeah. how do you kind of deal with some sort of variance you see from, you know, some kind of physical hardware impact of, Right, uh, yes, so because um, substrate weights are time, uh, they are the number of uh, picoseconds that an operation takes, I believe, is the measurement of weight. Um, that is based off of real hardware. Um, Parity has recommended hardware for polka dot validators, um, and your recommended hardware for your chain should be no better than that, or else a polka dot validator might not be able to, you know, run all of your computations in time if you have a full block. Um, we base our benchmarking hardware off of their sort of standard recommended validator hardware so that our times are sort of in line with, with what um, actual validators will run. Um, and we recommend that our collators use sort of similar spec hardware. Okay, so, so you, you literally like, it's just some like AWS EC2 instance that you always use. Yeah, it's a it's a GCP instance, but yeah, we have a benchmarking server. Yep. Okay. Any other questions, thoughts? Uh, do you have any thoughts about like uh, smart contracts on Substrate, like Ink? And uh... I haven't looked into them in great depth. Um, you know, I think from my perspective, having Extensibility and composability is really good. Um, you know, XCM on Polkadot gives us composability, but not necessarily extensibility. Um, and I think trying to do something like XCM to Moonbeam for every sort of situation where a user might want to, you know, sort of script part of your chain is silly. Um, so, so I think it probably makes sense for for most applications to have some level of, you know, smart contract interface. Um, and and I know that we've talked about it. Um, but I, I haven't, hasn't, hasn't floated up high enough on my priority list to really dive into the details yet. Right, so the um, possible implement of the use case for smart contracts would be like, you, you, the, the parachain implements uh, like the core functionality and the core uh, uh, extrinsics that they want to expose, and then anybody can write a smart contract to call those and do interesting things and interoperate with other chains and stuff like that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I yeah. think that would be kind of how I would see the use case. Um, we, we also have some use cases that we've talked about where like we have a, 
a set of possible, you know, ways to compute the the value of a of an NFT, right? And like that could be a place where a user could, you know, maybe plug in a little smart contract and and be able to have their own valuation schemes and, and things like that. And we've we've talked about kind of having like actual sort of extension points in the business logic, not just letting users layer things on top of it. Um, but again, we haven't sorted out the details yet. Right. So uh, early in the presentation, you talked about you know how you really like that Substrate has the you know on initialize, on idle, on finalize. I'm just curious, what are some of the things that you guys have, have leveraged that for? Yeah, so this was my uh, my most recent bit of optimization was uh, so so what uh, Centrifuge does is uh, it's a it's a lending on chain, so we have to compute and accrue a bunch of interest rates. Um, and what we uh, are now doing in on initialize is we uh, are constantly ticking forward uh, every interest rate at every block. And when a new uh, asset comes in that's priced with a certain interest rate, uh, we normalize that price to whatever the current interest rate is. So if you know five percent has you know accrued forward. Um, we, we normalize your, you know, $100 and it'll be, okay, it's whatever, 80-something normalized and you multiply it by the accrued rate and it comes out at $100 at, you know, the T0 for that loan. Um, so that, that lets us, um, you know, we do that in non-initialized now, which means that any math involving interest rates, computing the, the current present value of things, doesn't have to tick forward rates. We don't have to deal with exponentials in every single extrinsic, which also simplifies our benchmarking. Um, so that, that, was, that was big for us on, on initialize. Um, we've also talked about using uh, on idle to uh, opportunistically uh, refresh uh, some computations uh, that you know, users can fire off an extrinsic and say, I want this you know, latest computation to be done for like the total value of a pool of assets at the current time based on their interest rates and all that. Um, and we could we could potentially opportunistically update that in in on idle sort of whenever there's time available uh, in a block. If there are no other questions, uh, can you can you talk about that on idle in a block? Like, uh, is is that just something? If there's spare room, you can do some. You can like. Pre yeah. do some computation so then the user doesn't pay for it later or something like right so um, the way there, there's I think sort of three block life cycle hooks um, in substrate maybe more but three that I have looked at um, on initialize which happens at the start of every block and gives your palette an opportunity to do some computation that it needs to do every block um, or sort of at least at the start of a block sometimes and it can check if it has work to do or whatever um, on finalize, which happens at the end of a block, so if there's any you know state that's in sort of a temporary state um, that you want to sort of commit to something final, or if there's things that are in storage that you don't actually want to fully commit to storage, you can erase the storage item before the block is finalized. Um, things like the timestamp and the block number do that so they don't end up in the database because you don't need them in the database, they're in the block header. Um, and then there's on idle, and on idle is just called whenever there is spare space in a block. Um, so if you know users have only used half of a block with extrinsics, then it'll say, "Hey, you have half of your block weight available." Um, the function is called. It tells you how much weight is available, and you can do your computation to fill up as much of that as you have computation to fill. Um, you know, obviously there's if you're if you're doing a lot of things in on initialize or on idle or on finalize. Um, you know, you have to figure out how to appropriately, uh, you know, compensate collators who aren't, uh, you know, getting paid with transaction fees and things like that. Um, but I think um, on idle is especially good because you can, you know how much space you have available. If you're doing heavyweight computations and on initialize, you sort of have to figure out like, eh, what's the most of a block that I want to let this take up and set a weight limit. Um, you know, if you have multiple pallets that are potentially doing really heavyweight things and on initialize, you know, you need to plan for the worst case, right? And say, if all of these have to run, there's six of them, they can only use a sixth of a block each. Whereas if it's on, on idle, then they kind of opportunistically fill in whenever they can. Um, 
So on, on idle is really powerful, I think, and, and you know, really all of those block lifecycle hooks um, that give you control over computation, like you can't do any of that on Ethereum, right? Someone always has to fire off a transaction um, to make the computation happen. Yeah, so does that kind of avoid the pattern in Ethereum where you often have before a user, like at the beginning of a user's transaction, you'll go and like update all of these values. Like for example, it is uh, like a debt level or an interest rate or something right. like that. Right, yep, so exactly. I think right. like, uh, you know, Maker does something similar to what I was talking about with like normalizing values to a shared interest rate. But in a Maker transaction, uh, whoever, <laughs> whoever gets to it first is the one that has to pay for doing that update. Whereas we do it on initialize and it's just, you know, it's a common feature of our chain that interest rates are always up to date and available for code, right? And no one has to pay that. Right. Does does anyone pay for that, or is it just like? Uh, yeah. It's no. There's no transaction fees for it. So depending on how you know, it's it's up to you know parachains or you know chains in general how they compensate their validators and their collators through block rewards, right? And making sure that it's. Um, but but no, generally you know, I think of the economics of paying for block space, paying for a transaction, um, you know, is, is about, largely about abuse prevention, right? Um, not, not letting someone fill up the block um, and, you know, compensating collators and validators is sort of a different economic question, right? So when we're dealing with these life cycle things that are built into the chain, um, you know, the, the chain operation isn't, it doesn't have the same, you know, the need to prevent abuse that transactions have, right? Cool, thank you.